Welcome to the Modern CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping accounting firms achieve success. If you're an accounting firm owner who wants to learn how to provide virtual CFO services, then this podcast is for you. All right, Adam, so we just talked with uh, Tom Barrett. I know this is our third time bringing um, Tom in. So um, just kind of curious, I, I think the listeners would love to hear our background with Tom because I know this is our third time bringing him in. He brings a lot of good information, but um, you want to give a little bit about how um, Summit got connected to Tom? Yeah, it was a long time ago. We were um, working with the Bureau of Digital. So that's um, that, that was like our, our niche was working with digital agencies. And that was uh, industry leader. You know, they were an association. And so th- we were a subject matter expert, obviously, on the financial side. And then Tom and Tracy owned Navigate the Journey at the time. Uh, Tracy's more of like the business coach. And then, um, and then Tom at the time was doing some things with, um, it wasn't really, he wasn't EOS implementer at the time, but he was doing StratOps, which is a different kind of a platform. And it was basically about how to like operationalize your strategy, which is, is kind of cool. And, you know, Jody and I have always been into that stuff. So, you know, again, we, we talk about all the time, we, you know, came up through eMyth and all that stuff and we read a ton of books. So we're always, I don't want to say we like, um, but we're definitely not Kool-Aid drinkers, but we like hearing different perspectives and different mm-hmm. systems and seeing if there's something that we can implement. So whenever we saw the opportunity to, you know, how they worked with digital agencies and as a CPA firm owner, I mean, we're basically the same thing, right? Um, we're like that kind of structure as we're growing would be extremely helpful. I mean, if it's just Jody and I, eh, whatever. But at the time, we were like going through growth mode and we were hiring people, trying to figure out how to better leverage people. We were going through that thing where, Jamie, I've told you 19 times. <laughs> and you're like, no, dude, you didn't. And I'm like, yes, I have. We've been doing it for five years. And you're like, well, I just started last year. So I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so we were like, <laughs> we need to figure some stuff out. So yeah, that's how it started. We met him at, uh, at an industry event you know, listen to his talks. He was listening to ours, developed a relationship. Uh, Tom and Tracy are just great people individually. So they were fun to hang out with. Um, And so we just kind of, it kind of evolved from there. I think, I think that's the key. So I know um, I get a ton of emails, you get a ton of emails. I'm sure Joey does as well. A ton of LinkedIn people trying to connect with Summit. The secret to connecting with Summit is meeting Jody and or Adam somewhere and having drinks with them and having a good time. Like, honestly, that's where most <laughs> of these things start. Like, I know I've been to plenty of bureau events and hanging out with uh, Tracy and Tom is always fun. And we always go to the bar and have dinner together and really just have a really good time hanging out. And then, you know, obviously bringing something to the table as well really helps. And so I think that, that's the, yeah. that's the key. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, we're all service-based providers, so it really comes down to, you know, connecting at a personal level. You know, if you want to be a good advisor, you're going to have to connect at a part. You can have all the answers. You can be the smartest guy in the room if you want to, but that's not really what people are always looking for. Some of the, the foundational stuff is permission to play. You know, we talk about that all the time. You know, they assume we're good at accounting or we know what we're talking about from a business perspective. The hell, do they want to talk to you or do they want to throw up every time they're going to meet with you? Um, Now, granted, there's conditions, you know, that apply, you know, obviously, if if things are going crappy, and you're talking to your finance person, but they should feel like, you know, you're on their side, you're not like coming in and just so anyway, yeah, whether it's a a client relationship, a vendor relationship, or just a colleague, hell yeah, we enjoy like hanging out at the bar, having a good time getting to know the people individually, you know, just, it just creates a a totally different working relationship um, that lasts a lot longer that way. For sure. So in today's podcast, we, we talk quite a bit about meetings and I know uh, I've been at Summit for four years and our meetings have evolved and changed. And obviously Tom's a big part of that, but um, I'm, I'm ex- I think this is a good podcast because we really had good examples of how our meetings have changed. And then again, hopefully I know you were a big part of this implementation, but I think it was a really good podcast because we went into that and talked about our process a lot. So you want to touch on that a little bit more and kind of, again, just a brief summary of where we are, where we've been and where we're going with meetings. I mean, we've been everywhere. That wouldn't take too long. So, I mean, meetings suck. Everybody knows they suck um, to some degree. I mean, I would say that's not true for us anymore. I do feel like 
for the first time in a long time. And we've done a lot of different mating cadences before, and we had all kinds of agendas and, you know, some of that stuff just doesn't stick and new people roll in, new people roll out, you know, it's just one of those things where I think the, the level 10 in the EOS process, you know, if you stick with it and you really work through those meetings, I do feel like we have very effective meetings and personally as like an advisor, I mean, and I, I mentioned this to Tom, but I think I've, you know, it's been great internally. Don't get me wrong. Like, love it. But I think I've learned more um, being able to use that and put that in my arsenal as an advisor and take it to other clients and go, hey, your meetings suck. Yeah. You have a poor culture. You know what I mean? Like, maybe you need an EOS implementer. Uh, let me show you how it kind of works. Let's structure a meeting. So even if they don't do EOS, I'm able to take like a flavor to that and clients love it and appreciate it. It's like, oh, you guys your stuff together yeah of course we yeah. do as a cfo <laughs> yeah as a cfo like our job is meetings a lot of the job is meetings if you're a cfo you're probably in 20 to 30 hours of meetings a week so it is important to know how to run a good meeting and also advise the client on how to run a good meeting so i'm um, excited to get to this interview hopefully you guys enjoy listening to it so let's get to tom barry hello and welcome to today's podcast today we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject meetings so everybody's seen the memes out there about how terrible meetings are and about the meetings can be taking place with an email and all that good stuff. So today we're going to just talk about what makes a good meeting, how to make a meeting a little bit better. But um, to start off, we're actually going to talk about why people hate meetings so much. So Tom, do you want to kind of just go down that path a little bit and what makes an ineffective meeting for us? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So when I, when I'm uh, engaging with a prospect, working with a client for the, the first time, it's almost universal uh, that, the vast majority, if not every uh, single team I've ever worked with, uh, has come in to working with me with a belief that their meetings can never be productive and effective. And they've just kind of given up all hope. So yeah, so, so I, I do have a few insights, I think. Um, so first, I think, is that uh, people are frankly just distracted, right? Because of that kind of the vicious cycle of uh, just thinking they're never going to be good. We're sort of multitasking and with every, you know, all the devices we have and electronic channels of communication, like people are just can never unplug from it, uh, everything and just focus on, you know, who's in the room, who's in the meeting. So that, that one's, that one's pretty big. I mean, it's pretty tactical, but that, that one, that one's big. How much um, of the yeah. distraction is because you're, you, you're in a meeting you don't really belong in. Cause I know anytime I get distracted, it's because we're spending 45 minutes talking about a topic where it's, it just doesn't relate to me. And so I'm like, okay, why am I here? What am I listening to? I might as well be trying to get something else done. Well, yeah, completely, right? So, so I think that that's part of the problem because uh, sort of one bad and effective meeting leads to other bad and effective meetings that people shouldn't be attending. So the whole thing does snowball. So, so again, this is why it's such a common thing because people are like, I just need to be barely here uh, with 10% of my mind uh, in this meeting and 90% of it somewhere else. So yeah, so, so yeah, so I think reviewing who's in what meeting uh, is part of the fix. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like I said, that's usually what leads to my distraction is either it's the first 45 minutes. There's like the five minutes at the end of the meeting that I really need to pay attention to. But it's that first 45 minutes where they're talking about a completely different apartment or something that just doesn't really relate to me at all. Or I have no really um, reason listening to that section. So I'm like, okay, I guess this is the part where I can check out. So that's usually what gets me distracted. And I, I know I've done it before. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I watch you do it, Jamie, quite often, <laughs> as a matter of fact. So for me, that's, that's definitely um, that's not really my thing because I'm usually pretty involved with everything just based on my role. My bigger thing is, is I've got three monitors on my screen. So whenever it was in person, it was really easy. Don't get me wrong. I was always doodling on my little notepad and drawing pictures of people and stuff. But, um, but for the most part, I was involved and engaged. and It was a lot easier to do physically. Um, but now I've got Slack up on one side. I got email up on the other. I've got my phone sitting right next to me. So I'm just like constantly um, getting dinged. And, it, and it's almost like you're addicted to it because even whenever I turn my notifications off, which would be a nice little tip for everybody or minimize your stuff or turn it off, you almost just feel like you, I, I don't know, you just do it without even realizing you do it you open up your email or you pop open your phone or i don't know so you need a buzzer you like one-on-one -on -one emails you've even been in one-on-one -on -one meetings where you're like looking at the person and you're like this person is totally not listening to what i'm saying there <laughs> you can tell right. by the glaze in their eyes so yeah it's uh, yeah. it definitely is easy to get distracted yeah so that, i i see that one being number one for sure absolutely yeah. 
so I'll, I'll give you guys another one. Uh, I think just a lack of objective, like facts, figures. Uh, so a lot of meetings, there's way too much uh, subjectives, opinions, kind of egos that are they're ruling the meeting. Uh, so of course this does, uh, you know, um, speak to the, you know, the importance of, well, first of all, having, you know, actual numbers, right? What are the operational numbers of our business, you know, every day, every week, month, et cetera. Uh, and then, you know, whatever the kind of goals or priorities, you know, for the year, quarter, month, that we have some kind of objective way of saying what those are and then how we're making progress. So that's also usually lacking in meetings. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a big reason why uh, they're ineffective as well. Because they're more about like, so you're saying they're more like topic driven rather than goal driven? Is that? Well, yeah, I'm going to say more subjective driven than objective uh, or at least at least a part of it, I would say that a really great meeting, some of it needs to have an objective element to it. So, so it's a little bit like, imagine any sports uh, game, if there's, if there's no scoreboard, right? It's, it's not a game, we're not playing to win or lose, it's, we're just practicing. And I think too many meetings are a little bit like uh, a game of pickup basketball where nobody's really keeping score and not all that much into, are we gonna win the game or lose the game and not clear on that. Um, so, so I think that's really what it's like. The scoreboard isn't working, uh, in the meeting. Yeah, no, I think that yeah. makes sense. And I think the other part that goes with that is you have to make sure everybody in the meeting understands how the scoring works, right? So you, you know, if you have a couple people in the meeting that have never played basketball before to stay with that analogy and they're like, why, why, why are these people winning and losing? And so you have to make sure everybody understands the, the goals and how they work and what they mean. And also like where we've been, you know, I think that's the other part that's really important is like, if you, you know, if you're looking at your gross profit as a goal and you're at 45% and you're like, ah, oh, that's not that great. But if you get the context of what well, we used to be at 30% and now we're at 45%. So we've seen this improvement. So I think that's the other part that is really important with those goals is to make sure everybody in the meeting understands where they've been, but also what they mean. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Yeah, they, they got to see their part and move in the needle, right? And how, how these numbers relate to them. Yeah. What else do you have for us in terms of an ineffective uh, meeting? A lack of drama or tension. So, you know, so I think this does go to also kind of the related issue, sort of like of team health and organizational health. So, so you know, uh, good meetings should be like, you know, like a good movie or something you watch on Netflix, right? It, you're kind of drawn in. There's some kind of uh, tension introduced pretty early on. And this does go back to the objective measures. Because, and, it, and this is what makes sports games so great, right? Because we're always looking at the, uh, at the scoreboard, you know, how much time is left in the game. And so once we introduce those objective measures, know what winning is, then we're going to start really wanting and needing to engage uh, and willing to have some uncomfortable conversations. So, you know, if the three of us were on a team, we'd be like, hey, hey, Jamie, you know, you're responsible, you know, for number X. And last week or last month, it was not good. So we really need to go there. And, and you know, it's always hard as a human being uh, when, you know, we, when in front of your two teammates, we're going there, right? So, Tom, you didn't perform last week, last month, but we need to dig in and understand. And so, then, yeah. I, what I heard is I need to yell Jamie more often in the meeting so everybody else can feel the tension and enjoy the drama more often I'm not sure that's possible Adam <laughs> maybe maybe they will uh, maybe they're gonna yeah maybe they'll stay tuned and not check out and go look at their emails um, but you, you're right healthy conflict is important and uh, and that goes a long way you know just being candid with one another and just making sure we're holding each other accountable I think our team does a great job of um, that that's usually whenever we, whenever we rank our meetings at the end, just to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page, uh, when there's been a little bit of that in the meeting, I think that, um, that people are more, you know, inclined, you know, the, the other big one that you talk about a lot is, you know, not solving issues was kind of the, the other one. And the, those two, to me, kind of lend each other hand in hand, um, in that, um, you know, that, that drama kind of, a lot of times that healthy conflict leads to, um, solving an issue. And I can say for certain, actually, that when we rank our meetings at the end, um, the high scores always come from whenever we actually brought something up and we solved it. Yeah. Um, if we don't, everybody's kind of like, eh, it was an okay meeting because we didn't come to a resolution. 
Yeah, I think the other part too about the conflict that I like about our meetings is, you know, the example Tom used and you kind of used too, Adam, is, is not really usually how our conflict goes. It's not usually like Adam just picking at Jamie of, okay, why is this missed? Why is this going on? It's usually more of like a team thing. And I think there's usually a handful of people, I hate to use this term, but on, on each side of it. But I think that that's what makes the debate healthy is that, you know, I give my context and then, you know, Tom jumps in and supports my ideas. Then Adam comes back and has a question about both of the to Tom and I's ideas and just to have like multiple people involved in that discussion also makes it much better. And I think that's normally how our meetings go. So you don't feel like you're being ganged up on in terms of, I have a really bad idea here. So. Yeah. And, and again, there, there's the, you know, to work on that stuff, there definitely are larger issues, you know, the, the culture of the organization, frankly, if you're the, if you're a leader listening to this podcast, I think you definitely need to take a look in the mirror and, you know, if, if you've got some artificial harmony going on on your team, uh, again, you know, you, as the leader, you always got to, you, you, I, I say the leaders I work with, uh, you know, I'm going to gonna give you the high five for everything that's going great here. And then everything that's not going great, I'm going to say it's on you. And that's always the healthiest way. So, so again, it's really got to start with the leader and their, their tone and style is probably really influencing whether or not their, their team is going to get into healthy conflict. Yeah. What I think is so cool about this is that um, not only does it help us internally with our internal team, but if you, you know, even if there was only just a couple of you, maybe it's not as, as important. Um, if there's only like two people in your company, you know, if you're a CPA firm and you're kind of on your own or whatever, um, but it's multi-purposed. So like everything that we learned about having a good effective meeting that we've learned from you over the years, um, not only does it apply internally, but the methodology um, you know, you can kind of bring that to the client and the client really appreciates, you know, having some structure to the meetings, helping improve the meetings and doing that kind of stuff. So, I mean, with all that said, I mean, we just talked about the reasons why we all have crappy meetings or feel like we don't get a whole lot out of it. Um, but you know, how do we, how do we, um, you know, break that down and, and make the more meetings more effective again, not just internally, but externally with our clients, especially, you know, as an advisor going into a client meeting, if I have four or five people on the other side and I'm kind of solo, you know, I, again, I think they sometimes look to us as advisors to kind of help straighten out the meeting and make it effective meeting. They always talk about, you know, what metrics should we be looking at that kind of a thing. So I think that, uh, you know, we can break that down and, and help those meetings as well. Yeah, yeah, completely. So yeah, so you can apply that same right internally and externally. So I'd say a few things first is sort of, you know, well, what, what kind of meeting is this? So is it sort of, is it a say an annual planning or quarterly planning, you know, internally or externally, right? And so carving that out and, and doing that separately, then your more say weekly, more tactical meetings uh, is really critical because when you're not doing that internally and externally, you kind of have, you know, this meeting stew or mush they kind of all blend together and you're trying to do tactical and strategic uh, in the same meeting and so so yeah so making it clear what the purpose of the meeting is and then from that uh having a really clear agenda that's actually going to achieve what the purpose of the meeting is yeah, I know. I think that's been especially helpful for me when I was on clients was that agenda. And I think that's the biggest thing is a lot of times we just go into meetings and be like, what's up or what's on your mind or what's keeping you up at night? And that those type of meetings didn't, I mean, again, it's, it's important to ask those questions sometimes, but that can't be the whole agenda of the meeting, you know? So I think that's, you know, when I was early on at Summit, you know, I, I definitely failed quite a few meetings. And I think that was why. And once I'm like, well, okay, this meeting is going to be this, you know, this meeting is going to be our pipeline meeting. And we're going to talk about pipeline for 20 minutes. And then at the end, I'm going to ask those type of questions and case there's any other topics you want to talk about but people aren't feeling like they're showing up just to be asked the same questions over and over again and have no answers and pop out of the meeting after five minutes you know so i think that has really helped me when i was a cfo yeah but i think the i mean just to back that up a little bit the agenda is important but i think how we came up with the agenda was naming the meeting so i mean For i sure. think that there's I think there's a lot of power in naming things. And so the name a lot of times for us is what the purpose of the meeting is. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then at least for me personally, what's worked is like once that meeting is named, go, okay, so what's the, you know, then you can kind of walk through, okay, what's the purpose of the meeting? Okay, if that's the purpose of the meeting, here's some, you know, rough things that we're going to make sure we cover every meeting. So 
it, you know, you don't want it to be so rigid that, you know, you got 25 bullet points that we're going to cover every time. What we usually do in our meetings is we, we name the meeting, we set the agenda, the agenda usually has three to five bullet points. And we just say, hey, during this meeting, it's going to, it might go a little bit out of order, it might be this, it might be that, we might spend more time on one area than the other. But we're going to hit these, you know, these same three to five items, because I think that also allows people to understand who should be in the meeting as well. Once it's been named, it's like, why would I ever be in the biz dev meeting? I have nothing to do with mm -hmm. business development or things of that nature. Yeah, that that reminds me of another uh, reason why you know meetings aren't as productive or as effective as they 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 could be. Uh, is that yeah that so that the certain issues or topics that are being uh, discussed in the meeting, say say if it's a company wide leadership team, um, they'll notice that wh why on the agenda are we talking about these very tactical in the weeds issues? And so that that's part of the struggle, especially you know with entrepreneurial businesses where you know you kind of start out small, it's really just one big team, but then right as you grow you need to have better delineation on, you know, yeah, is it a company-wide issue? Is it a marketing issue? You know, is it some kind of operations issue? And having kind of those compartments uh, internally to, to, to make that be discussed at some other meeting uh, is really critical. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, and as an EOS implementer, I know this is a big part of it in, in what you're talking about there where we dive into the weeds a lot of times in order to keep our meetings on track um, I know IDS is a, is a big part of that. So we'll, you know, we do our little departmental updates and we're giving very, you know, objective things really quick. And then it'll, it'll really quickly, like all of a sudden we'll go into a rabbit hole. And then um, the team's usually pretty good about identifying, oh, rabbit hole, you know, maybe, maybe that should be something for, for IDS. So can you talk to us a little bit about IDS and how that works? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, IDS is super helpful. So for every listener, this is definitely something to incorporate into your meetings, even if you don't use EOS fully. So here's so IDS stands for identify, discuss, solve. But I'll uh, I'll walk you guys through sort of how it works. There's really I would say four parts. So sort of first part is uh, there's an issue, right? So again, imagine a meeting agenda and you got a list of issues. And so I'm going to use actually a personal example. I, I, I use this all the time because when we use the following, people get it. Uh, but, we, but when we then try to apply IDS in a business context, we forget the following. So say if the issue on the, the bullet point is say Tom has recurring back pain, right? That's the issue. So what would I do, right? If I, you know, say for months, I had really bad back pain, really killing me. Uh, I would make an appointment with a doctor because we would need to identify the root cause of my back pain. So that would involve, say, the doctor sending me off for, you know, x-ray, scans, blood work, whatever, right? So that, because we're trying to identify the root cause, because we just can't figure it out. And even the best doctor in the world can't tell from just looking at me, they got to dig, dig, dig to identify the root cause. So then say I come back a week later, and the doctor, you know, she tells me, Tom, you know, your scans showed it's condition X. So we've identified the root cause because it's condition X causing your back pain. Here are your three options, you know, surgery, medication, physical therapy. And so, right, that, that's the discuss part. And so then I get to choose, right? Those are my three options. The S stands for solve, right? I get to pick one of those options, whichever one I feel is best, weighing up the pros and cons of each, make the solve. And that should get rid of my back pain, right? Because that, that's truly solving an issue. My back pain goes away. So I tell that to every team I work with and they're like, yep, get that. But it's actually difficult for teams to apply that in their meetings. So yeah, so you kind of have to work on it together. And yeah, the, the, you know, the squirrels and people going off track and you know, typically what happens too is they'll start IDSing an issue, starting to discuss it. And then they'll go on to issue number 27, right? Never, not, uh, not having the discipline to stick with an issue till we actually solve it. What I, what I found is really important too, and a couple of things here is one is, is keeping that issue list as well. And so like, you know, you talk about your back, that, that what we just talked about was great, but that may take, you know, six, seven weeks to get solved. And so it's important every week to look back at it and be like, hey, Tom, how's your back? You know, and be like, oh yeah, I just got the test results back. I need to do one of these three things and then we can decide what it is. And so I think that's that's been always important for us is that, you know, again, sometimes the solving doesn't happen in that meeting. And we have a couple ideas and we have a couple um, paths we can go down and we're going to go out 
go down that outside the meeting and then report back next week. And so I've found that to be really important. And then the other thing that I want to throw out there, kind of to Adam's point and your point as well, is I think it's really important to have a moderator because if you don't, you're going to start doing the IDSing in the wrong part and you're going to spend like 30 minutes going down that rabbit hole. And so we, every meeting we have has a really good moderator that just jumps in and be like, all right, guys, let's, let's just move this to the IDS and talk about it at the end of the meeting. So I think that's the other important part that um, I, I found in our meetings that has made us change a lot. Yeah. And I'll do a plus one on that and then add another little uh, insight. We, in EOS, we actually recommend that you have a, a designated facilitator, but then also a separate person who's actually the designated documenter of all the key things, right? They're pulling up, you know, your scorecard or issues list, you know, and recording new things that come up during the meeting. So I'd actually recommend that you have both of those roles uh, in meetings. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. And, and we definitely do, and, and we keep track of it, and we roll it forward. We have the, the format where you have the scorecard like you're talking about, but, but this IDS is really, I think, what, what takes the meetings over the top, is if we do get in that rabbit hole, we go, whoop, let's just get through the rest of the agenda, and then let's revisit this at the end, and let's have a discussion. And as Jamie mentioned, I mean, on one hand, yes, they can carry over for weeks, but then, you know, for, for me personally, I would just caution against them rolling too far ahead um, because, you know, again, for, for our team, whenever we feel like we've succeeded the most in a meeting is whenever we get to that S, whenever we get to that solve. People want to walk out going, hey, agree to disagree. This is the solution. This is what we're doing. Let's plow forward. And it's the same way with clients. Like whenever we introduce this topic with clients and we just say, hey, like, let's just push this to the back of the meeting. Let's hold some time for, to discuss it and see if we can come up with a resolution. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, we're coming up with that solve or at least the next immediate step that can then be followed up on the following week. And, and clients appreciate that documentation and that discussion and that solve. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree that a lot of times we do solve it right away and that does feel good. And I, I think the other part, um, kind of going back to earlier, like why meetings are ineffective. I think one of the things that frustrates people more than anything is you spend too much time with the I, right? Like you can you can talk about the I for 40 minutes and that then it becomes a complaint fest. Like you're just identifying something and over and over different people are complaining about it in a different direction. And I think we've had that. I know one of our meetings, the meetings with our seniors, that's what it was. It was basically an hour long I meeting and that's all it was. And so we had to kind of change this format and introduce this format. And I think since we've done that, it's definitely felt a lot more effective. Yeah. And when that's happening too, one of the things that's probably happening is that the, the issue uh, really that there's actually multiple issues packed into one. So when that starts to happen, uh, that the best thing to do is actually start to go, you know what, and when you're starting to identify the root cause, say, hey, we're starting to discover other issues that are, that are discrete and need to be carved out on their own. Uh, so that, that, that's really important because it, sometimes issues just get too big to truly identify root cause, truly discuss, truly solve. So, so yeah, you just got to be careful that you're, you're, you're not uh, trying to solve something that's too big. Um, yeah, so talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the, the goals and the rocks, I guess, on the EOS, what they call those. Um, yeah, yeah so, yeah, so for listeners, uh, if uh, you guys are interested in a, you know, for a more effective internal weekly meeting with your team, EOS has a, a meeting called the Level 10 um, meeting. And so here's kind of how it works. So first step is just, use, and it's a 90-minute meeting once a week. Uh, and again, it is well worked. It saves you time. So you just segue into the meeting. Uh, so one piece of personal good news, one piece of uh, professional good news. And then you, and you do that in five minutes or less. So you're pretty quick. Uh, then you go in a number of reporting items. So this is where we're interjecting kind of those objective measures, right? Uh, so one of the ways we do that is a scorecard. So bringing up our, our key numbers from last week, how did we do um, you know, business-wise, what are our numbers telling us? Uh, and also look at 13 weeks of history as well to give us a sense of patterns and trends. Uh, you know, if you've got some kind of quarterly planning process where you've got rocks or some other kind of bigger long-term goals, we typically recommend bringing that list up to and saying, are, are we on track or off track with each of those longer-term goals? Um, then we look at, yeah, to-dos. So the, the level 10 meeting in the U.S., has to-dos, their seven-day action items that come out of it. So at the beginning of the meeting, we're checking in. It's like, hey, Adam, did you get your to-do done from last week? Yes or no? Um, uh, and then we have another, um, the fourth and kind of final item in terms of the whole reporting is what we call customer 
and employee headlines. So, so is there something that I know that everybody should know at a headline level? And, and part of the power of the, the level 10 agenda in EOS is with those four reporting items there, the, the scorecard rocks, um, uh, to do's and, and headlines is that if anything is really big, we say drop it down and make it an issue. Um, so, so that way then, so then the next item is you, you've got about 60 minutes for your IDSing. So you look at all of your issues. Some issues have been added at the beginning of the meeting. You prioritize your top three issues from a you know, longer list and then start IDSing. Issue number one, don't move off that till we solve it, then go to issue two. So you get 60 minutes of that. And then with five minutes to go, you recap new to-dos, you ask, are there any cascading messages? And you actually rate the meeting, have every person in the meeting rated on a one to 10 scale. So, and then if, if people rate it less than an eight, we say, you know, go back to them and say, hey, what would it made today a 10? If you, you know, Jamie, you rated it a seven, what would it made today a 10? So that you can correct it immediately. So that, that's the, the really quick overview of the, the, the EOS level 10 agenda. So yeah. on, on we follow reading, that pretty, okay, so go we ahead. follow that every single week. Um, and then a lot of times, if it's a smaller group, we'll do 60 minutes, you know, just kind yeah. of cut down the, the IDS part. Yeah, I was going to hit on the ratings a little bit. So I know um, when we first started, um, our ratings, for the most part, were pretty good, but it took us a while to get to the point where we had, we're having a lot of the, the 10 ratings. How, how long do you normally see for those meetings to get to the point where everybody is pretty satisfied? Again, I know you're always going to have that meeting where people are like, yeah, this one wasn't great for me, but, you know, you kind of consistently start hitting those eight, nine, tens. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely going to take a few months. So, you know, you're, I've never seen a team who implement the level 10 agenda, you know, start having, you know, nines and tens quickly there, you know, you usually got to work out the kinks and the bugs. So, so, so that's normal. Uh, I, I think there's probably then maybe two different extremes as well in terms of ratings there, there probably are some teams again, where there's some kind of cultural issue that people are just going to say a nine or a 10 because they're not allowed to say seven or six, right? Uh, so that's not good. Uh, people shouldn't, you know, and that's again where the leaders got to really say to everybody, you got to be completely open and honest, completely candid. We want really, like if you say 10, it really, you really mean 10. Uh, so you got, you got that extreme, uh, but you also probably got the other extreme. You're going to have some individuals who say they'll rate it a seven or, or something like that. That's six or seven, whatever. And, uh, so, so uh, basically what they're probably not exactly just rating the 60 or 90 minutes. They're actually probably unhappy about other things. And that that's part of the power of going back and asking again, Jamie, okay, you said seven. Okay. So what would have made it a 10 today? And by asking that we're going to start understanding sort of what else is going on with Jamie. And he's probably going to say, well, Tom was too long winded, uh, went off on tangents and he'd be right, uh, but at least right where now we're knowing. So Tom next week has to, you know, not be long winded, all those kinds of things. And, and so, yeah, so, so there's all kinds of uh, factors going into the ratings. Some people struggle with that though. You know, they, they don't, they'll give a higher score just because they don't want to be picked on, you know? Exactly. So even if it feels like it's open and honest in typical summit fashion, we do the same thing. Only we only go to five. I don't know. 10 seems like a high number for us, I guess. So we just kind of cut it in half, but um, we also played around a little bit with the psychology of that in that whoever went first um, kind of set the tone. So we would kind of mix things up a little bit and Jody and I, as, as kind of leaders on the call um, would intentionally score differently and see how that changed the tone. Like, so if I started off and I said five, everybody behind me, five, 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 Jody goes three, then everybody behind him, four, four, <laughs> you know, and then we would kind of see how that was, how that was playing out so that we could have those conversations and start talking to people about that. So we played around with it a little bit as well. That's funny. I, I didn't realize you guys were doing that, but yeah, I can see that now. Um, <laughs> but I think the one thing that early on for us, and you, you talked about this a little bit, was the to-do list. I think that's one of the things that got us quite a few lower ratings when we first started doing this is that to-do list was so long that you hardly had time to IDS. Like the to-do list had like 30 items on it. Like, okay, how's this going? How's this going? And it was 
so so long that like by the time you got through it all the ids was down to like 15 minutes and you didn't really get any time to solve and so i think that within the last year our to-do list has been down to like one or two or three items and to me that has made our meetings way more effective because we have had time to solve and we have had time to really get into those issues so that's kind of one area early on that i think made us have to build up to getting those um, fives more often yeah, and that and that's typical, right? So when when teams really try to fix their meetings and say they use something like the the level ten agenda, you're you're going to find things like that that uh, say you you don't have you know your scorecard has like one number in it instead of you know the seven that we want, or yeah, your to do list is you know seventy eight items long because we're catching up on all the prior stuff we never did in the past. So yeah, so you. You know, uh, so one of the sayings I use with my clients is, you know, progress, not perfection. So that's where if you're trying to overhaul your meetings, I think you need to get realistic about, uh, you know, the incremental change you can make week to week. So just just be patient. It'll, it'll take a while to get there, typically. Yeah, patience is definitely key when it comes to, to changing your meeting. It's not going to be overnight. So I'm just going to take a, a quick second here to throw the email address out. So, um, you know, we're always looking for uh, new topics and new subjects. So if um, you're interested in uh, joining the show or have some subjects for us, um, feel free to email us at cpa at summitcpa.net. So always looking to have uh, new ideas there. So um, we have a couple minutes left here. Adam, uh, Tom, any final thoughts for the listeners? Well, so I mean, my, my big uh, passionate plea to all the listeners is uh, don't give up your meetings truly can be great. Uh, it's hard work, uh, but it's worth it. So, so I would say, uh, yeah, really re-examine uh, all of the meetings that you do internally, externally. Uh, think about all of the sort of wasted time, uh, wasted productivity and, and also frustrating results that, that your, your business is getting, your teams are, are, are getting because their meetings aren't great. It really is a a litmus test really on the effectiveness and the, and the health of an organization. Yeah. And I would just say that, I mean, while that sounds, you know, like everything we just covered sounds intense, it's really brilliant in its simplicity that if you really just break this down, it's just kind of like bang, 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 get in and out. Everybody knows meetings can suck. Make sure you got the right people in there. Follow this, um, you know, check out the level 10. I, I've seen it work over and over in all kinds of different situations. So I would I definitely highly recommend this to your clients, use it internally and just make sure, you know, that scoring don't, uh, you know, there for a little while, we let that scoring kind of go by the wayside. That scoring is very important. So I would say just make sure that everybody on the team understands what the walk away of the meeting is. So whenever you're talking about purpose, say, hey, this is what we should be left with at the end. We should have a clear understanding of what. And then as long as everybody understands that, it's easy to rate and figure out what you're doing right and wrong and, and do those tweaks that Tom was talking about. Yep. And there's also lots of great implementers out there, just like Tom. So if you're, if you're struggling implementing this process, you know, there's lots out there and, you know, obviously you can reach out to Tom. He does this for plenty of plenty of people and a lot of our clients. And as Adam mentioned, he did it for us as well. So it's very helpful to have someone guide you through it if you need it. So. Yeah, and he's got a geeky accounting background too. So, um, so yeah, he works very well with uh, CPA firms. So um, definitely check that out. And uh, digital agencies, those are, I mean, I think it applies to just about anybody. And I know you have a wide portfolio, but, uh, but definitely working with CPA firms and, and uh, with digital agencies, you have a lot of experience. So, yep. All right. This has been great. This has been a 10 for me. <laughs> I guess a five for you. I was going to say, I give it a five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll we're only five. On a five. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Tom. Thanks, Adam. Enjoy this episode. Visit our website at summitcpa.net to get more tips and strategies for achieving modern CPA firm success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry.